So good evening and welcome to the Biosimilars What You Need to Know webinar. My name is Christina Schaefer. Um, I am a wife, a mom, a daughter, sister, and aunt. I'm also a full-time social media marketing professional and an on-camera personality for one of the largest member trade associations in the country. Um, but also, I am an arthritis patient and I have been living with rheumatoid arthritis for 18 years. Um, for many people who have autoimmune and inflammatory types of arthritis, like me, biologic medications are literally life-changing. Um, they control our disease uh, and control our symptoms. They can also slow the progression of arthritis. That's why in tonight's webinar, we're going to explore little known biologic medications called biosimilars. Our experts will help us understand the difference between brand name biologic medications and biosimilars to control arthritis and how they may affect our current treatment plans. Before we get started, a few housekeeping notes about tonight's session. We have muted all attendees for this event, but you can direct any questions you may have throughout the presentation in the Q&A box on the bottom of your screen. Uh, we will start this evening with a brief presentation by both experts, followed by a roundtable discussion. We'll reserve some time to answer questions at the end of our discussion as well. Any questions we don't have time to get, get to, and trust me, we will try to get it to as many as possible, but any we don't have time to get to, we strongly encourage you to refer to our helpline at arthritis.org slash helpline. If you haven't already, also please consider filling out the arthritis insights assessment. It only takes about 10 minutes to complete and it helps the foundation develop programs like this one and speak to what's important to you. After tonight's session, you will receive an email asking about your experience. These surveys help track the success of these sessions and better plan for future events. So please take a few minutes to fill out that survey once you receive it. So I'm gonna start out by introducing tonight's esteemed expert panel. We have Dr. Angus Worthing, a practicing rheumatologist at Arthritis Rheumatism Associates PC in Washington, DC, and a volunteer faculty member at Georgetown, where he did his rheumatology training. He serves as chair of policy for the DC Rheumatism Society and serves on the board of directors for the American College of Rheumatology and previously was the chair of the, their governmental affairs committee. He has spoken about access to rheumatology care and treatment on behalf of rheumatologists and patients at government U.S. agencies, Congress, the D.C. Council, the Maryland General Assembly, and state and national rheumatology meetings. We also have Elisa Vit Vitalich. Elisa is the policy director at the Arthritis Foundation, where she advocates for state and federal legislative and regulatory policy to improve care and support patients living with arthritis and chronic health conditions. Most recently, she worked at Avalar Health at Adv advising clients on health policy issues, including vaccines, infectious diseases, substance abuse, and pain management. Elisa earned her Master of Public Health in Health Policy and Management from Emory University Rollins School of Public Health. So thank you both for joining us tonight. I'm going to go ahead and hand it over first to Dr. Worthing for a brief presentation about the differences between our current biologic medications and biosimilars. Welcome, Dr. Worthing. Thanks so much, Christina, and uh, welcome everybody to the talk tonight. I'm thrilled to be able to give you um, my perspective and uh, maybe an introduction or maybe a little bit of a deeper dive than you've had before about biosimilars. Um, and this, my part of this will be probably 10 or 15 minutes, and I look forward to taking questions and having kind of a roundtable discussion at the end. Um, it's customary in, in medical lectures to give any disclosures, and I, I wanted to let you know in advance, I have no relevant disclosures in this topic. Um, and also that I, I was an author on the American College of Rheumatology white paper a couple years back about biosimilars. Um, so uh, Rachel, next slide, please, or Christina, whichever is doing. Thank you very much. So briefly, a little background. What are biosimilars? Um, you may have heard of these before, but if you haven't, 
Um, backing up a little bit, biologics, as you may know, are made in a living cell, which is why we call them biologics. <clears throat> and the cell is reprogrammed with new genes to um, make the cell create the medication. So in the case of autoimmune disease, biologic therapy, they're mainly making an antibody that attaches to a specific uh, signal, a cytokine or receptor in the immune system that will stop or shut down um, the disease. Biosimilars are basically follow-on biologic products. They are themselves biologic products, <clears throat> and they're made with the same blueprint that was developed by the bio-originator or so-called brand name biologic. Um, why are we hearing about biologics right now? You may actually, or biosimilars right now, you may actually be on a biosimilar or a family member might be taking a biosimilar um, because they've actually been around for a little while, about seven years in rheumatology. Um, Remicade, uh, the second biologic that was available to rheumatology patients in the US was uh, basically went generic. I'll, I'll, I'll say this in quotes in 2016, and Inflectra, followed by several other biosimilars to Remicade, became available uh, 2016, 2017 in the US. So we've been using medications that are biosimilars in the US, but it was this uh, infusion. So this type of drug given in the clinic or in the hospital or infusion center as an IV. Next year, and this is one of the, uh, we're on the, the threshold eight weeks from now, uh, in 2023, the first available patient-administered biosimilar will be available. So Humira, which is adalimumab, um, patent will so-called expire, another air quote, pardon me about that. Uh, the manufacturer of adalimumab, Humira, and I'll start saying adalimumab now instead of the word Humira because it will be more relevant. Uh, like drug manufacturers in the US had a 20 year patent, that patent has expired, but in recreating the drug, uh, developing new um, forms of injection, citrate free uh, format for administration, multiple other patents um, came on for adalimumab, for, for Humira, and those have not yet expired uh, and they wouldn't for 10 or 12 more years. But the manufacturer entered into a lawsuit recently with the manufacturers of biosimilars who had gotten their product approved. And that lawsuit was settled with an agreement that next year in 2023, we'll have biosimilars. So the purpose of this discussion is, as I can see it, is not only to talk about what's been happening with biosimilars and rheumatology <clears throat> and our experience, clinical studies, my own experience, but now we're on the precipice of using biosimilars probably a lot more in 2023. Um, the, uh, I think I'm moving on to the next slide. So what are biosimilars versus their reference or name brand biologics? Um, if you uh, care to Google or read uh, the prescribing information for a biosimilar, which is um, basically a, a highly regulated by the FDA document for a drug company that's making a product that's FDA approved in the US, you'll see it looks almost exactly like the reference biologic prescribing information. And that's because they generally, they're the same compound. Um, adalimumab uh, Humira is, uh, or the, uh, the biosimilar for Humira is also called adalimumab, I should say. They have, uh, bio, you can know biosimilars because they have a four letter suffix right after the name of the drug. So an adalimumab biosimilar will have um, ATTO or ABDM after a hyphen after the adalimumab. <clears throat> and they treat the same diseases generally. Um, once they are approved, FDA looks at all the data to look for um, whether these diseases can be expected, uh, the drugs can be expected to treat the same diseases that the uh, brand name or reference biologic treats. So uh, adalimumab is useful for 10 different diseases uh, in the United States. Um, and biosimilar adalimumabs will also be uh, useful for those same 10 diseases. Um, I want to talk a little bit about how biosimilars are not generics. And um, this goes back to how you cannot specifically duplicate exactly uh, a biologic compound. 
because they're made in a living cell system. And if you can imagine going to a pharmaceutical company that's uh, on the factory floor or on the, the place where they're making biosimilars, it kind of looks like a brewery. There, there are big vats of cells making medication. And though the medication is siphoned off and, and cleaned and the cells are separated off from the medication. In that process, um, although a manufacturer of a biosimilar can make uh, a medication that's the same exact uh, string of uh, proteins, um, it's ultimately going to be a slightly different from the biologic name brand <clears throat> because in that cell, um, where genes come out of the nucleus uh, and are transcribed into the protein. The protein is then brought um, in sort of a, a packaging uh, Golgi apparatus up to the cell uh, surface, and then um, it's brought outside the cell and then ultimately put in a, a pen for injection or a bag for transfusion, but uh, or infusion. But along the way, it might be folded slightly differently. It might uh, get attached to an extra sugar molecule or two, the solution that it's in might have an extra electric charge or um, different numbers of electric charges near it. And so the medicine itself is slightly different from the reference biologic. I want to let you know that since 1998, since we've had biologic drugs, the cells that make those drugs themselves are living cells and have changed and reproduced. Uh, and so that environment is not exactly the same as the initial 1998 and 1999 environment that was making uh, the first version of the brand name. And so in my view, uh, biosimilars are probably in, in many cases more similar to a reference biologic now than that reference biologic is to its original batch back in the 90s. Um, and this explains a little bit about the FDA approval pathway for biosimilars, which I'm going to talk about. Um, and this is on the next slide, please. So how does FDA figure out whether a biosimilar is going to be equally safe and effective as the brand biologic reference product? Um, both are, are FDA approved, um, but the processes are uh, slightly different. So you can imagine creating a new compound. Um, for example, the, the first time adalimumab as Humira was created, uh, it went through testing to see if the adalimumab attached to the tumor necrosis factor molecule, TNF, that we know of. It was tested in animals, it was tested in people, and it was tested in people with all 10 diseases uh, that it's known to treat. And it was approved each of those times. A biosimilar approval process is different. Um, biosimilars are first, um, there's three kinds of, of data that the, the FDA looks at when it's evaluating biosimilar safety and, and efficacy. First is, um, I think of it as um, taking microscopic pictures. These are um, analytical tools to look at the compound and make sure that it is not only the same string of uh, proteins, but that it is folded the same way that it um, attaches to tumor necrosis factor, for example, the same way. Then there can be, secondly, animal studies of biosimilars. And thirdly, there are usually human studies. So people and usually patients who have uh, autoimmune diseases are given the biosimilar. And tests are done to see that the concentration is the same when people take it, that, the, that it's um, at therapeutic levels in their system. Um, it's also uh, tracked to see if people are creating antibodies against it or becoming immune um, to it, which is called immunogenicity. And then outcomes are tracked. So the, um, at the end of a, a clinical study, are people doing just as well? Are, are they having side effects? And the uh, FDA has called that group of three different kinds of data in biosimilar approval process, the a totality of evidence. And no one component is um, more important than the rest. Um, but the FDA looks at that entire process to number one, approve, and number two, decide for which of the diseases uh, the reference product is approved that the biosimilar will also be approved for. Um, 
So that concept is a lot more in depth um, than the approval process for a generic drug. A generic drug is um, when a brand name drug, and we'll call these small molecules, these are drugs that can be can be an infusion, but these are pills generally, penicillin, um, a very well-known one. Um, that approval process generally includes just um, proving that the drug is the same sequence of amino acids or proteins, and that the concentration is the same in, in people's system when they take it. So the biosimilar approval process a lot more complex than simply approving a generic drug, which makes sense because living systems create slightly different molecules, as I was saying, and the drugs are a lot more complex. They're a lot larger. These are probably 300 times, 200 times larger than penicillin. Um, so back to the approval process, these um, uh, and these uh, prescribing documents that I was talking about, and as you'll see, biosimilars have the same name. They're the same strength and dosage. So if, for example, adalimumab is given in a 40 milligram shot for many people, um, smaller doses for children, uh, larger doses for um, various diseases, and it's given every week or two generally by subcutaneous injection. Biosimilars are gonna be the same, same strength, same dosage, same frequency. Um, so all those things are, are similar. Um, and then finally, um, I wanna talk about side effects and something that's called the nocebo effect. Um, you can expect that a biosimilar will have the same side effects as the reference biologic drug. Um, just as you can expect it to be equally effective, it will also have the same list of toxicities. Um, so that's a, a strength, I think, of biosimilars that we're um, through that FDA approval process. And now, as I said, for six years or so in the clinic, we've had experience with these uh, drugs through infliximab or Remicade biosimilars, and the side effects appear to be similar. If the side effects were different significantly or the effectiveness was different, if the chemical was significantly better, significantly worse in terms of how effective it was at treating disease, it wouldn't be approved as a biosimilar. It would, it would potentially be approved as a different drug, as a new drug of its own. Um, you may have heard of the placebo effect. So the placebo effect, we may or may not use uh, consciously in clinic. It's uh, the, uh, the beneficial effect of um, subjective factors about a drug. Um, there's also uh, potentially a nocebo effect. And I wanted to tell you a little bit about, about this kind of carefully as we talk about biosimilars. Um, to uh, actually not recent, three or four-year-old clinical studies that were done on biosimilars in Europe with infliximab biosimilars in people moving from Remicade to um, Inflectra. Um, one study was totally blinded. It was called the NorSwitch study. It's, it took place in Norway and it switched people from Remicade to Inflectra. So it was the NorSwitch study. Um, 240 people switched 240 people stayed on Remicade and they were blinded. They didn't know and their doctors didn't know which uh, group was which. Um, and uh, a strength of this study was that it was a pretty big study. Uh, it was the first such study uh, to have this kind of blinded um, switching. And it included people having multiple different autoimmune diseases, including rheumatoid arthritis um, and ankylosing spondylitis. And, uh, the same numbers of people had disease flares and side effects in each group, which is pretty, pretty reassuring to me. And, and I tell my patients about this. Um, but after this, uh, a study was done that was not blinded uh, and not controlled in that same way. So people moved um, from Remicade to Inflectra and they knew about it uh, and they were compared to a smaller group that wasn't moved, that continued on uh, Remicade. Uh, and the authors of this study noted that more people developed problems, um, joint pains in the case of rheumatoid arthritis. Um, they had uh, concerns about side effects and switched back to Remicade or switched off of that to a different biologic compared to the group that stayed on Remicade. 
And the authors looked at the two studies and said, you know, this is this is new. Um, this is unexpected that um, more people had trouble with this. Um, the only difference between these studies was that they and their doctors knew that they were taking a, a new drug. <clears throat> and so they thought maybe there's something important about the way in which that transition is communicated that bears on the effect of the drug. Um, it's not totally clear if this is the case, but a lot of us reading this study uh, realize that we have an opportunity as we're taking care of people, um, and especially this summer and this fall in advance of 2023 and adalimumab biosimilars coming, I'm taking the opportunity to tell people a little bit when we have time in clinic about the FDA approval process, that it is robust in my view, and that biosimilars are expected to have the same safety and efficacy so that people are comfortable with it in case they transition to a biosimilar in 2023, that maybe that optimal communication about the medication, um, positive expectations might be helpful. Um, I don't know, we'll see if this is helpful, but um, I figure it's good medicine to just inform people about it. And, uh, and the authors recommended um, optimizing the way in which biosimilars and transitions are communicated. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about my own experience. As I've been saying, we've, we've used biosimilars in clinic and um, several years ago when I noticed that Inflector was becoming significantly less expensive, knowing that some patients pay out of pocket um, in accordance with the list price or proportional to the, the price of the drug. Um, I began talking with people about moving to a biosimilar and gave them a choice and told them about my views about them. And for probably two or three dozen people who moved from the brand uh, reference biologic Remicade to Inflectra or another biosimilar, um, as far as I can remember, everybody but maybe one that I remember um, did just as well as on the original drug, which is about the percentage of people that tend to have um, disease flares or side effects with it. And um, so I wanted to give you that um, impression that my experience so far with biosimilars has been good. Um, and I was happy to be involved uh, as the rheumatologist representing American College of Rheumatology at FDA when FDA was considering um, the, the approval process <clears throat> and how biosimilars were being rolled out, um, having meetings with the professionals there and the rheumatologists there at FDA. And so my experience has been good so far, and I'm looking forward to what will hopefully be much improved access for patients, um, people who may not have been able to afford or their insurance might have blocked biologic drugs before. Hopefully these people will be able to utilize these life-changing drugs um, as biosimilars drive the prices down and improve patient access. So I hope I haven't been talking too quickly uh, tonight, and uh, I look forward, as I said, to taking your questions. But at this point, I'll hand it off to Elisa, your policy director at Arthritis Foundation, for um, some information about what to expect and uh, patient access to biologics. Thank you, Dr. Worthing. That was a wonderful introduction. I think it was nice and clear, and hopefully we'll be able to answer some questions at the end, too, um, in our roundtable, because I'm sure there are many of them. Um, so as Dr. Worthing said, uh, we'll go to the next slide. What to expect in 2023? You may be thinking, great, I've heard of biosimilars now. We got our little intro. I know what a biologic is now. When are they coming? What's the scoop? What should I be preparing for come January and thereafter? Um, I will tell you, um, I'm going to go to the bottom of the slide and then go back up to the top. They are not all coming out at the same time. Some of them are coming out perhaps in the beginning of January. Um, most, I think, we are hearing perhaps um, over the summer next year. Um, biosimilars for Enbrel, for example, are expected to, when their patent expires, not until 2026, a couple are 2029. So they're not all of a sudden just bombarding the market next year. Um, so we'll have some time to be able to kind of continue talking about them, learning more and educating everyone. Um, who may be in the game here. Um, with that said, we do anticipate there may be an increase in competition. We're very hopeful that it will help promote uh, broader access for patients. 
um, to be able to take these life-saving medications like Dr. Uh, Worthing was just talking about. Um, a, a flourishing biosimilars market really can you know, advance treatments for affordable prices. It can help alleviate some of those healthcare costs. We spent a lot of time talking about your patient out-of-pocket costs. When I go to the pharmacy and I'm picking up my script or when I get the bill from the hospital, how much am I, the patient, actually having to pay and write a check for? And that is a really important dollar sign that we're talking about um, at the Arthritis Foundation and elsewhere. So payers and providers, you know, could use any savings that they might see from switching patients to biosimilars um, to pay for a variety of different areas to improve overall patient care. Um, uh, I'll, I'll give an example. A, a 2019 analysis by the Kaiser Family Foundation found that the average annual out-of-pocket cost for two reference biologics that are commonly used for arthritis was about $5,000 among Medicare Part D, as in dog, the prescription drug benefit um, with no income, with low income subsidies. Um, so biosimilars are expected to cost on average about 30% less than their reference products. Um, some analyses show that they could save the United States health system in, in total um, as much as $54 billion with a B as in boy dollars over a 10-year period. Um, so there is a lot of hope. There's potential. We'll have to see what, how it unfolds. Um, we do also reserve that there are several reasons why the availability of biosimilars may not increase access or affordability of medications. I certainly think we're very hopeful. but um, you know, there are some studies that have looked at, you know, over 500 different coverage decisions from 17 of the largest commercial health plans um, showed that only 14% had biosimilars as the preferred product over the branded reference biologic. So that's what we're looking for. The preferred product tends to have that lower cost sharing and or the administrative requirements. It tends to be a little bit easier. Um, but that same study showed that biosimilars were the non-preferred product in 33% of the cases. So about a third of the time, um, they're not the preferred product. That might change. We might see that evolve as the, you know, more products come available, as patients demand access, and doctors are talking about them more. This could evolve. It's not never green. I think people, you know, we, we are in constant communication with a variety of stakeholders, um, with the Arthritis Foundation partners. Um, and there are other reports that are indicating kind of various levels of, you know, confusion among stakeholders, like employers, for example, um, especially for those of us with commercial plans where we get our insurance from our employer through our job. Um, there, there could be some information. We'll have to continue clarifying and educating and doing a good job of, of kind of deciphering what the confusion is, where your cause for concerns and um we will continue to see it evolve over time. But I, I personally expect and very much hope that we'll see lower costs and greater access to care for patients. Go to the next slide. We can talk more about this. I know a lot of you are asking specific questions in the Q&A chat, so um, we will try to answer those as best as we can, uh, as many as possible in our round table. So, on the insurance side, you know, there are several different kinds of insurance. All of us have different plans. They're all different company names. They all have different rules. And on top of it, all the states have different laws. So the first one that I think we've heard a lot of concerns, questions, where do we stand? Um, formulary changes. It may not be cheaper right away. Like I said, we may see it become cheaper over time. Um, those mid-year formulary prohibitions can't change until the following January, um, and rebates could also play a role in impacting the formularies. So companies that offer the best rebates may still pre be preferred over the biosimilar because they've negotiated the, the dollar signs already. Um, it may not always be cheaper for the patient. Um, and so there are a lot of negotiation activities that go on behind the scenes before they roll out what your plan will look like. Um, I know there were some questions about Medicare versus employer-based insurance costs with the commercial plans. Um, currently, my knowledge is that many biologics, so self-injectables self are not covered by Medicare. Um, 
Will the cost for biosimilars be covered in any portion of Medicare remains to be seen. Um, for example, you know, a common question we hear is my medication isn't covered by A or B Medicare, the traditional Medicare. Will that change because of biosimilars? I think it's unclear at this point. Um, we are still waiting for a lot of information. Remember, this is kind of brand new to the system. A lot of new questions are popping up. We're having constant conversations. Um, and you may be wondering, like, is this going to be covered at all? My first advice would be to call your insurance company and ask, talk to your doctor and ask, but your insurance company um, will be your best bet regarding any of your very specific questions. And of course, our helpline with the Arthritis Foundation is here to support and help you too. Um, I did want to touch on interchangeability laws. It's a, a little bit of a interesting topic of concern. Um, that's the pharmacy designation. Um, the FDA grants to a product. Um, I will note there is only one right now in the rheumatology space that is um, designated for interchangeability. So this opens the door for the pharmacist to substitute a biosimilar for the branded biologic without consulting with the prescribing physician or even potentially making the patient aware of such a substitution. So um, your doctor's office might not get involved. And secondly, you'll get this process, um, it can be really confusing. And so what is what is happening? Um, maybe I should take a step back to and define an interchangeable biosimilar product. That That is the biosimilar that is um, able to be substituted for the reference product without that doctor. So what I was just talking about, um, it's similar to how generic drugs are substituted for the brand name drugs at the pharmacy. Um, I don't want to call them generic drugs because they're different, but it's a similar kind of a process, if you will. Um, and again, those are subject to the state laws. So interchangeable biosimilars still must meet all of uh, the additional requirements that are related to a, the potential automatic substitution. Um, however, both biosimilar and interchangeable biosimilars meet the same high standards um, for quality and similarity to the reference product. Um, so I think this will remain to be seen. There are several states that have passed or are currently considering laws regarding governing substitutions. Um, I've heard from many doctors who would prefer to see kind of a more uniform nationwide approach. Um, so we will see about that. But the Arthritis Foundation's position remains that the decision should be made between the patient and their provider. And that is what we will advocate for um, and have and will continue to do. Um, what else do I want to say about this right now? Um, there's a lot of wonky that we could go into. If you have more questions, I'm happy to dive into a little more. But um, I will say, you know, if you're going to a pharmacy for the first time and you're not sure, I would talk to your doctor. Um, every state has a substitution law that allows for that automatic substitution for biosimilars. Um, like I said, there's only one that has this designation right now. Um, and we'll kind of pause on that for a little bit. If you have specific questions, we can dive into that more. Um, and my personal favorite, this last bullet point here is on the future of prior authorization. This falls into the big umbrella of utilization management protocols. Um, I would also throw in step therapy as a form of prior authorizations. You've probably heard us talking about these. We've been advocating at state and federal uh, levels for many years on both of those topics, and we're seeing some movement finally. So um, there's a lot that's still unknown. I mean, I think that's kind of the name of the game at this point. Um, our position statement from the Arthritis Foundation, you can see it on our website, um, it says that Again, we believe patients should have access to their formulary and should be the ones that are realizing those cost savings. Um, so anytime the prior authorization, which is a tool that payers, your insurance company will use um, to increase the uptake of biosimilars, um, we're not sure if this is going to happen. We don't know how it's going to affect, you know, specific biosimilars or not. Um, I think it remains to be seen what this might look like. Um, we are always supportive as the Arthritis Foundation of Policies that seek to help patients 
have easier access to medication. And I think whatever we can do to eliminate some of these uh, insurance mandated protocol burdens and barriers to access to care for patients is the way that we would continue supporting and moving forward on those. Um, so I know that there's a lot of wonky here. There's some big talks about cost and how much am I going to see it? When is it going to come out? What are the insurance issues that I need to be aware of? Um, but those are just some of the highlights that I think so far, I know we have several, several questions in the Q&A and elsewhere. So um, I will pass it back over to you guys and we'll get started with our roundtable. Yes, thank you so much. So much great information so far. And I did see a lot of good questions coming in, but I have some questions if we could um, get Dr. Worthing back on and we'll just do a little round table uh, with the two of you. And I already saw this question uh, popping up from some of the attendees as well. You know, for many people on tonight's call, the idea of switching to a new medication can be concerning, especially if you're experiencing success on your current biologic. So what advice would you give those who are worried about making a switch um, and how should they approach this topic with their doctor if they have concerns? So we'll start with you on this one, Dr. Worthing. Thanks, Christina. Uh, that's a great question. And that's that's one of the main reasons I was excited to be here tonight is telling people and, and uh, opening up that question. Um, number one, I think it's a great uh, time now at your next appointment to talk to your doctor about, uh, about a biosimilar and just see what they're thinking about biosimilars. Um, as I said, we've had experience with infusion of biosimilars. Mm -hmm. We haven't had experience yet with people moving on uh, from a self-injectable bio, uh, biologic to a biosimilar. But I expect having seen um, two very rigorous clinical trials of biologic drugs in which people were doing well on mm -hmm. adalimumab and they moved over to the adalimumab biosimilar and then they moved back and forth, um, which you really don't want to do, but in, in American formulary management where one year to the next, one drug might be approved and then the next year a different drug might be approved. Um, we want to know that kind of data. And it turns out that uh, the biosimilars that have been approved in those studies, um, people did great move, alternating back and forth. And that's actually the concept behind um, approving something as an interchangeable drug that Elisa was talking about. Interchangeability is earned after there's a clinical study in which people are alternating back and forth at least three times and end up doing just as well as they would have been if they um, if they were in the group that just stayed on it. So big picture, safety and effectiveness are expected to be the same after you move to a biosimilar. And um, ask your doctor, you know, what their thoughts are about your specific case. That's great to hear. Elisa, would you like to add anything? Yeah, I mean, I'll just add, you know, review your health plan options really carefully. You can ask about, you know, what are the biosimilars that might be available to me? How much would my medication cost out of pocket? That's a big one. That's always a concern of patients. And of course, we would want to know that. Um, and you can directly ask your plan, your health insurer, um, whether any of those utilization management protocols like step therapy or prior auth um, would apply to your medication options. Um, of course, talk to your doctor. That would be our number one. Um, any concerns or reservations that you might have about switching, um, like Dr. Worthing said, they can absolutely, you know, talk to you more about, but the safety and efficacy of switching from a reference product to a biosimilar. Um, we are following, you know, trusted sources. Look at the FDA when you're researching anything online about medical treatments. Don't just Google and it can get really overwhelming. So making sure that you're talking to people that you trust and um, respected sources. Um, and then the helpline, the Arthritis Foundation helpline is always here to um, help you talk through any of your concerns or, or be a part of your care decision plan too. So don't be afraid to call us. We're happy to be there for you. So will the delivery modes be the same for biosimilars? And if they aren't, is that enough of a reason to appeal to using the original biologic? We can start with you on this one, Elisa. Um, good question. So there's a couple different conversations that I've been hearing, and Dr. Rubin, I'd love to know your perspective as well. Um, we've been having conversations about, you know, different kinds of injectors. All the products come with different injectors. 
Will the pharmacy stock all the options? I do not know the answer at this point. It will be up to the individual pharmacy or the major group that they are belonging to. Um, and then we'll have to talk about, you know, education and making sure we understand how to use the different injectors and what will that look like? Um, the short answer is we're not sure yet. There is only a handful that we know are coming right away. Um, there's a lot of conversation about products that might be citrate free. I know that's particularly of importance for our juvenile arthritis patients and their parents. Um, and different administration modes that might be available for kids versus adults. Um, I would say stay tuned and we will keep you updated on that. <laughs> Dr. Worthing, do you have anything to add there? Sure, I'll jump in. Um, for people who are interested in doing a, <clears throat> kind of a deep dive right now, uh, FDA's list of biosimilars is for one reason or another called the Purple Book. You can do purplebooksearch.fda.gov, uh, I guess. And and it tells you of the seven FDA approved biosimilars for adalimumab, which of them have the, the new citrate free concentration that doesn't sting as much, um, which one have uh, a pen, which have a syringe, mm -hmm. which have the pediatric doses, 20 milligrams instead of 40 milligrams. And um, it looks like there are uh, products with all of those things. And it looks like there are some that have just some of those things. So uh, like Lisa said, it, it might vary according to what the pharmacy has, or more likely like what the formulary contains for you and your insurance. <clears throat> um, after that, there's, you know, the look and the feel of the injector um, that might, you know, might be a slightly different color, or slightly different font. It's going to have a different name, um, but with the same molecule adalimumab or infliximab, whatever the injectable or etanercept as you're talking about inside the pen. So uh, my guess is that a pharmacist will have to, uh, you know, to pass the red face test, inform somebody that they're about to get uh, a substituted uh, biosimilar mm -hmm. uh, because the patient's going to open up the, the package and say like, this is not Humira, this is not Enbrel, whatever. Uh, but um hopefully they will be the same kind of delivery system, a, a pen, if you, people were getting a pen, a syringe, if they're getting a syringe, or, and if not, that that'll be adequately communicated before people actually get it delivered. So. Definitely some education will be needed there, if not. So great. Um, so Dr. Worthing, with the arrival of biosimilars, uh, will that impact a doctor's prescribing behavior? One person wrote in, why isn't my rheumatologist suggesting them right now? Yeah, great question. So uh, right now, as I said, we have experience with one kind of biosimilar that's infused. We don't have experience yet with um, self-injected biosimilars. So it could just be that your doctor might not have experience uh, and may not be thinking forwardly about how things are going to change in 2023. Um, the, uh, I, I guess my um, that's my main answer. I am talking about, I know a lot of my colleagues and, and friends in rheumatology are talking about with their patients. So, so some people may have actually had the, the opposite experience that, yeah, we've talked about it or people have mentioned it. And, um, but I guess that's my answer about that. Okay. Before tonight's webinar, uh, someone wrote in, if a patient tries a biosimilar and it doesn't work well, can insurance companies deny access back to the original biologic? So, uh, Elisa, we'll start with you on this one. Yeah, I, I think this is going to be a, a increasingly common question that we hear when people want to understand, you know, what what are the insurance requirements? What do I need to do? And oh no, what happens if it doesn't work? I want to reiterate though that you know the biosimilars are genetically very, very, very similar. It's mm -hmm. hopeful that it will be a, only a small minority of folks, like Dr. Worthing was talking in his um, example earlier, but. Um, you know, our, our position is that there should be a clear appeals process if you do have a bad reaction. Um, again, every insurance plan is different. They all have different processes. They all follow different state laws. Um, and you need to know what your individual plan's options for appealing those denials are and then have it in hand. Um, a lot of them have a chat feature online. You can look them up. I'm sure a lot of you are very familiar with picking up the phone and talking. Um, but just make sure you know what that appeals process might look like. Um, and then my other thought, again, always talk to your doctor. They can report 
Um, I'm not sure what the reporting structure will look like at this point, but we've started the initial conversations about um, whether and how providers can report any concerns or reservations that patients are having or any safety concerns. Um, so I would, I would absolutely talk to your doctor as your trusted sources online um, mm -hmm. and then uh, make sure you know what your insurance plan rules are. Dr. Worthing, do you have anything to add there? Sure. Um, people taking a medication when there's a side effect, just to, to get this out there, that um, MedWatch ha is a, an online source to, to report side effects to the FDA. And probably each of the companies that make biologics will have access on their website for reporting in through the manufacturer um, side effects. I know I get on my desk every once in a while um, a report from a drug manufacturer that a, a patient of mine has let them know that there was a side effect or that there was a concern. And they'll forward that to me to fill out um, some of the back end details about um, the person's case. So that's really important when people, any new drug that's released onto the market um, has been studied and approved, but there are very rare problems that come up inevitably. And mm -hmm. we don't find out about them unless the clinical trials go on and are very large or people report them when it happens to them. So I encourage you to report those back. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you both so much for that enlightening conversation. We're, I know we've already had some questions come in, um, but if you have questions, now's the time to get them in. And of course, um, you know, we, we do have numerous questions before and during. So we'll try to get through as many as possible. But as a reminder, any questions we don't have time to get to, we strongly encourage you to utilize the helpline that Elisa mentioned earlier. Again, that's arthritis.org slash helpline. So the first question that we have uh, here for you is, will biosimilars be available for other brand name biologics besides Humira? A lot of people have been asking about Orencia, for example. Yeah, great question. I'm um, not sure, Lisa, if you know all the dates, but the, there, <clears throat> the, uh, there are two Arencia compounds um, that I uh, know about and just doing some research tonight. Um, the patent has expired, but there isn't any uh, biosimilar that's been approved yet for Arencia. Um, there are biosimilars to Enbrel, um, Etanercept. Um, so we should expect them uh, and I'm not sure when a launch date is. That might actually be public information, but I don't know. And um, my guess is that the larger the market share of a biologic, the more biosimilars there will be. More companies are attracted to, um, you know, selling their product to more people, um, and probably the there will be at least one for every biologic agent that we've got in rheumatology right now. Okay, Elisa, anything else there? Yeah, I, I mean, I used to have a whole list of uh, all the dates and everything that happened, but they all <laughs> change and they modify, so I said, uh, don't want to tell you the wrong day, but keep an eye out for those. I mean, not very, very simply, not all, so Medicare Part D, I think was a question that we saw, is it Part D or Part B is boy? Um, and remember, Part B is the medical benefit, that's when the the product is administered by the physician and usually is inpatient or in the hospital or in an in-care setting. Um, but the Part D is in dog is the prescription drug benefit, and not all Part D plans are cover biosimilars at this point. But I think I think you're absolutely right, Dr. Worthing. I think um, as we continue to see more and more come to market, I would imagine you know 2023 to 2029, we're going to see a number of biosimilars that are covered by um, Part D is in dog. Um, so I would uh, leave there. Okay. Great. Yeah, that was actually the next question that we had that came in. Uh, will biosimilars be covered under Medicare B or D? Many Medicare plans don't currently cover biologics. So you you answered it before they, they uh, messaged it in. We have another one here. Does it take a similar amount of time to build antibodies to biosimilars? Uh, that should be, a, yes. The answer is yes to that. So if, as I was kind of alluding to, if a drug behaves differently in people, and has a significantly different immunogenicity is the medical term for this, um, creating antibodies against a chemical, then it is not biosimilar. Um, I guess, as I said, it's it's possible that in future uh, groups of patients that are taking a drug, potentially a new immune disease um, that 
in which immune systems work differently, that that might actually be different. But right yeah. now, biosimilars have the same immunogenicity as biologics, so just as likely to become immune to it. Okay. Um, we had another really great question that just came in. Do you think that biosimilars will have patient assistance programs? 30% of brand cost is still pretty expensive. Yeah, I, I mean, yes, this is the short answer. I do anticipate that will continue. Um, we know, you know, $2,000 is still a very high out-of-pocket cost for most people, and especially when you're a chronic patient and you hit that maximum out-of-pocket cost maybe in January or February, March at the latest. Um, so I do anticipate that we will see um, some kind of manufacturer copay assistance. Um, and increasingly, as we see more products, we might see additional services as well. But short answer, I believe, yes. Good. Wonderful. Um, another question here. Is it smart to switch to one of the first few biosimilars or wait to see what else comes out in the future? You want to take that one, Dr. Worthen? <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's um, forward thinking. I like that. I, uh, <laughs> there will be seven, uh, I think all in 2023 or shortly after uh, Adelima by biosimilars. <clears throat> um, I'm not sure that how how long a biosimilar has been on the market or um you know that the age of a biosimilar is as important um i think the the two things that are important are the data about the drug uh and i think you can be confident in fda's approval process and and secondly like your access to the drug if if it's covered you have a obviously a lot more better chance of getting it than if it's not covered if it's if your insurance is covering one or two out of the seven biosimilars, you know, and, and not the others. Uh, obviously you, you, I would not recommend trying mm -hmm. to pay for this out of pocket uh, at the levels of prices these are. So okay. yeah. Interesting question. Yeah. Very good. Um, another question here about the antibodies. So will a biosimilar work if a biologic doesn't, for example, if someone has already developed antibodies to a biologic? You can expect that if uh, somebody's making antibodies to the biosimilar, they're making antibodies to the biologic because they're they're so similar. Mm -hmm. um, theoretically, it's possible somebody's making an antibody to a portion of the medication that isn't there on the on the biosimilar. Um, but generally, if if a drug's not working, uh, it's not going to work. I would expect it not to work uh, to move over to a biosimilar. Okay. Um, question here is, is it important to have a, a washout period? <laughs> I think every patient on here knows what that means, uh, before switching to a biosimilar. No, I, I definitely wouldn't do that. A washout period means that your body doesn't have the medication in your system. And, and then if you then start taking the biosimilar, um, two things can happen. Number one, during that washout your, your joints, your disease could come back and disease could flare. Um, and number two, when you see that drug again, um, your body, that's when people can have a higher risk of becoming immune to it and, and have immunogenicity, start making antibodies. So it's best to um, have just a continuous process where you don't interrupt the treatment. Okay. Um, and what are the, what is the status? And, uh, you might know this, uh, Elisa, I'm sure Dr. Worthing, you do too. What is, what is the status of developing biosimilars for children with JA? That's a great question. I actually don't know the answer, Dr. Worthing. <laughs> sure. Yeah. I, I happen to know that I, I do know, although I, uh, I saw kids in training briefly. I don't treat, uh, um, younger kids right now, but Yes, biosimilars are available for children with JAA. Um, the adalimumab biosimilars, uh, at least one I know about, has been approved for juvenile idiopathic arthritis. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so you can, and then I, as I said, there are the pediatric doses available uh, for at least some of the biosimilars. So um, kids should be able to have access to biosimilars. Um, I will say one thing that um, the initial approval process of biosimilars um, did not allow uh, a drug to be used in rare diseases. And so if pediatric, I think pediatric Crohn's disease was considered, it was either Crohn's or ulcerative colitis was considered a rare disease at the time. Mm -hmm. So the biosimilar didn't have 
um, an FDA approval for that um, illness. I think that has changed since then, but um, something that's slightly different about pediatric diseases and FDA approval. Okay. Um, another question here. I've been told that if one goes off of Humira for about three months or so, and then you go back on, Humira may take longer to work. Is this accurate? And could it happen if a biosimilar doesn't work and then you switch back to Humira? Many pieces to that question there. <laughs> I track. Yes. So yes, that is getting at um, immunogenicity, this concept of uh, the drug getting out of your system. And then um, once you restart it, your white blood cells may recognize it as foreign and create antibodies against it. And that perception of it not work, not um, working as well means that you're neutralizing it at first and may take a while for the drug to kick in or it may not work at all. Um, I would think of moving back and forth from biologic to biosimilar in that case would feel like you're taking the same drug. You'd have the same immunogenicity against it, probably. Um, although, as I say, maybe not. And um, so probably not uh, worth going back and forth if you're becoming immune to a drug. Okay. Um, if your dose is 80 milligrams of a biologic and you're prescribed a 40 milligram biosimilar, can you just use two injections? You may. That's uh, exactly what a lot of people would be doing. Yep. Okay. Let me double check I'm on the other questions here. Oh, one more just came in. If um, this is from someone who's new to biologics and biosimilars, the side effects, uh, liver damage, et cetera, scare me. Uh, what exactly are the risks I can reasonably expect? And are they the same as biosimilars? Great question. At least I'm just going to jump in on some of these. I, you are the doctor. That's why we brought you. So So um, totally depends on, on two things on which drug we're talking about and on um, the specifics of the person taking the drug, their past medical history, um, illnesses they've had um, and other concerns. So, but I'll say big picture, you know, talk to your doctor about your case. Big picture, 1998, as we had methotrexate for rheumatoid arthritis, for example, um, rheumatoid arthritis was, was causing disability still. Um, people were getting joint damage and needing surgeries. Their, their life expectancy was shorter. <clears throat> methotrexate was working for about half the people taking it, but it, it wasn't working well for the, the rest of people. Now, people's life expectancy is the same. Um, they're having fewer heart attacks, fewer infections way less orthopedic surgeries uh, from rheumatology. So, um, and, the, and the difference, not only in medical care and, and hygiene and other things, but uh, people are using biologics. Um, and that's that's one of the main differences since then. So um, I tell people that um, these drugs do have side effects. We wanna watch for them. We'll monitor for toxicity sometimes with lab tests in the clinic. But overall, you can expect that the medication is going to be helpful um, on average. Okay. Um, there was a, there we are. Are these the same as bio better drugs? I might punt. I, these are not bio better drugs and we don't have those in the United States, but Elisa, and by the way, I meant to mention about following up the last question, um, biosimilars can be expected to be equally um, safe or have the same side effects as biologics. But Elisa, do you know about biobetters or, or where they're from? I only in passing. I wouldn't know that I feel uh, confident in responding here, but um, okay. basically it's, it's a new class of biologics. Um, they're in the market, they're called like biobetters. Um, they're supposed to be thought to be better, which is where the name come from. Um, it's supposed to be like a new and improved version, like a 2.0, if you will. Um, or every time your iPhone gets an update, it's like this new version or new model. Um, I believe that uh, the NIH has a lot more data on more detailed and technical definitions of what biobetters are, but they are um, new drugs that are designed from existing peptides or protein-based um, therapeutics um, with improvements. Um, other than that, I am uh, not sure that I would recommend or know what else to add to that conversation, but there, mm -hmm. there is a follow-on biologics, if you will. So 
Okay. Um, have protocols been devised for patients to report any adverse effects experienced after being switched to a biosimilar? So I, I would say Dr. Worthing mentioned the one earlier um, about, you know, reporting to your physician and, and they have a method um, individually. Now, a nationalized program, I know many of us are familiar with a variety of other products and vaccines often have um, nationwide databases or repositories where you can report yourself, report to your physician. Um, clinical trial data, they all report to the physician and you can report directly to the manufacturer too. Um, at this point, there is not one standardized system that exists that may come to fruition next year or thereafter, um, but I don't believe that there is one at this point. So if you do have any adverse side effects, your best step is to talk to your doctor and make sure that they're aware of um, any of your um, treatment symptoms, track your data, you know, write down any notes about changes in your health outcomes or experiences with your treatment. Um, and that way you can share it with your care team. But there are no uh, one master program that you can Google and find out where you should report at this point. Okay. Um, another question that just came in, can you purchase biosimilars outside of the U.S. for a much cheaper price? Oh, great question. <laughs> Probably. Uh, I don't know the answer to that, Dave. Do you know, Lisa? If I, I'm as, a, as an official sure. foundation uh, steward of Goodwill, I uh, am not able to answer. No, I, <laughs> I you know, there, there, there's a reason why the FDA has their process. We believe that they are rigorous and robust in their scientific review and evidence. Um, when in doubt, I would always talk to your doctor. Okay. I'm in Texas and about six hours from the border. I promise I didn't write that question though. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, last question that we have here for you. Um, I, I'd like to hear from both of you. Um, what are your top takeaways for the audience? Everything that was discussed tonight, all the questions included, what are some of the top takeaways that you have for the audience about biosimilars? And we can start with you on this one, Elisa. Sure. Um, a couple of messages. Um, number one, getting the message out, you know, educating on what the safety concerns are, treatment efficacy, potential side effects. Um, I know in our most recent patient survey on biosimilars, um, those were the top three types of information that patients wanted to know the most. And so we're hopeful that this webinar can be there to support you. Um, the number one thing the Arthritis Foundation is doing is working on communicating clearly with patients um, in as many formats as possible, as many forums as we can about what expanding biosimilars market might mean for you. So um, if you have suggestions or recommendations or questions, you know, we're always happy to help. We want to make sure we're getting the message across in a way that is um, clear and understandable for you. Um, so we are working on best practices for patient-facing communications about biosimilars. Um, but reiterating the data that switching from a reference product to a biosimilar is safe, it is effective, and there are clinically um, meaningful parity between biosimilars and the reference products. Um, we believe and trust the FDA's rigorous protocols, their recommendations and language that we're using. So we're trying to ensure there's some consistency um, with all of our partner organizations in order to explain kind of a really crazy wonky complex um, concept and help avoid any biases there too. Um, I'll also throw out because I am policy director and um, the advocacy and, and uh, access team um, is taking on a lot of questions about biosimilars. We are advocating on several pieces of policies at the federal and state level with regard to drug pricing reforms, um, prioritizing, you know, that patients shouldn't have to pay co-pays for certain things. So um, ensuring that you receive cost sharing protections for biosimilars, um, including or, or perhaps uh, in addition to copay assistance from the manufacturer is one of our top priorities for you. Um, and working and advocating very, very hard to ensure that there are no unintended barriers to, um, preventing your access to those biosimilars um, in any kind of state or federal legislation or regulatory rules. Um, so we are hopeful. We want to make sure you know that we are advocating for you and we are um, looking forward to seeing what 2023 has and uh, at the next several years after that. And thank you. When in doubt, always call, talk to your doctor. The helpline is here for you. 
And Dr. Worthing, your takeaways. Sure, thanks. I guess I would say almost what Elisa said, and I'll try to say it differently. Um, if you know biologics, you know biosimilars. Um, so if you're taking one of these drugs already, a biologic drug, biosimilars are the same kinds of drugs developed in the same way. <clears throat> and so I think you'll find them pretty familiar. Um, the uh, the approval process has been done with advocates like us and Elisa and I working with FDA and working together our organizations with other patient advocacy organizations. Um, and it's been a robust uh, multi-decade process. Uh, so you can trust in that. As Elisa said, biosimilars can be expected to be equally safe and effective for the same diseases that the reference biologic uh, is um, treating and it uh, and it's okay and totally reasonable. And I've done it with my patients to move from the one to the other. Um, finally, uh, ask your doctor about these things and but also have some grace with your doctor's office because we just like you are learning about biosimilars, we are learning about biosimilars and we're gonna be facing um, requests by your insurance, your pharmacy, and you to, with questions about moving or denials of the bioriginator and moving to a, a, um, a biosimilar, sending out a new prescription and giving you a call to talk about it, um, which is not currently part of our care program. So have some grace with us as we go through this with you. Um, but knowledge is power. Find out more about it. Uh, become confident in it. And um, I, like Elisa, I'm looking forward to 2023 to see what happens. And maybe look up that purple book you mentioned. <laughs> Nerd out on the purple book if you want, yes. Yeah, very good. Well, thank you both uh, for your time this evening. Several people were telling us um, that this was very informative. So thank you for lending your time and your expertise this evening. Very welcome. Good night, everybody. Before we sign off for the night, just a reminder that we have several resources and events coming up to help you manage your arthritis. Uh, the arrival of biosimilars may impact your care plan. Uh, the Arthritis Foundation's RX for Success Toolkit has abundant resources to help you answer your lingering questions about insurance and help craft the right plan for you. You can visit arthritis.org slash RX for access to get started. And remember, the foundation's trained staff can help you navigate your arthritis challenges from treatment questions to insurance and healthcare access questions and more. So visit arthritis.org slash helpline to learn more about that. This actually is our last webinar of 2022, but there will be many more to come in 2023. So please check back in December for updates and new registrations. That website is arthritis.org slash webinars. Um, also, we are going to be releasing a podcast on November 27th, Biosimilars 101 and Anti-Inflammatory Arthritis. This conversation about biosimilars continues on the Live Yes with Arthritis podcast. So tune in uh, to hear from an expert who regularly prescribes biosimilars and what he thinks is the future treatment for inflammatory arthritis. Um, you can visit arthritis.org slash podcast to listen or subscribe wherever podcasts are available. Um, as a reminder, taking just 10 minutes to fill out the arthritis insights assessment can help develop new problem, new programs, excuse me, that speak to what's important to you. Um, so visit arthritis.org slash insights to take that assessment. If you've taken it before, guess what? You can take it again. So take 10 minutes uh, at some point, maybe right after this is over to go fill out that assessment. And lastly, please note that in a few days, you'll receive a survey asking about your experience at tonight's webinar. Please take the time to fill out that survey completely and honestly, so the foundation can best serve you in the future. Thank you again so much for joining us tonight. Take care, everyone.